Hello. Hi. 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 Hello. I'm curious about. I'm curious about. I'm curious about. I'm curious about. I'm curious about building open, authentic, loving relationship. I'm curious about jealousy. I'm curious about polyamory. Does it just mean that you're fucking all the time? How can I tell my parents that my partner is already married? I'm curious about. How do you know when you're too busy to have another relationship? I'm curious about dominant and subordinate relationships. I'm curious about. Sexual health. How can relationships relationships evolve with people as they grow and change? change. Simultaneous stimulation of the of the Mm -hmm. penis and the prostate. The first time that ever happened to me, I thought I was on a rocket ship ride to the moon. (laughs) It was the most incredible sensation ever. Yeah. And and it made me realize, wow, people are really missing out. It's like somebody (laughs) hit my reset button. (laughs) That's fantastic. Welcome to the Curious Fox Podcast. For those challenging the status quo in love, sex, and relationships, my name is Effie Blue. And I'm Jacqueline Mislaw. And today we're celebrating Pride and Men's Health Month by having a conversation about queer sexual health and best practices for anal sex. And while our conversation centers at moments on gay or queer men's health, We all have butts, as Effie likes to say, and so (laughs) there is important information for everyone about how to play safely and keep our bodies and relationships healthy. I do think, like Dr. Carlton said, the butt is the great equalizer. We all have one, (laughs) and if you like butt sex, even if you like your butt touched, maybe not on full penetration, it doesn't mean anything about your identity. It doesn't make you any, mm-hmm. it doesn't make you gay. Not that there's anything wrong with being gay. It doesn't make you or anything to do with your masculinity or femininity. It is just a part of the body that feels good for some people, a lot of people. So the invitation is just to go out there and, and you know, be curious and wander around and see what happens. And personally, mm-hmm. I personally don't, love being a bottom like I don't like being a bottom for butt stuff I don't mind it I don't seek it mm-hmm. it's not something that I'm like I mm-hmm. must have it all the time when it does happen I actually do <laughs> when enjoy it becomes it. about yeah <laughs> it exactly. comes about I'm like, oh, yes. if I want a mood I'm like why not uh, with the right person <laughs> so the thing that I do I find it interesting more than anything I think I find it interesting I just think that it, it's it's a part of the body that is really sensitive and a lot of emotion is there, right? Like your butt, your sphincter is is where a lot of like stress is held, is connected to your mood. It's it's a real kind of um interesting part of the body. So for me, when that gets mixed up with sexual energy, mm. for me, it's like mentally titillating as well as physically arousing. So that's kind of why I go there. Mm-hmm. And the things that I find interesting for me is that anal sex r- has a way to really anchor me in my body. It it really mm-hmm. goes towards my sort of like mind body connection. For me, I have to take it super super slow. So mm-hmm. that makes me like take my time, be super intimate, slow, patient, somewhat lazy sex that that I like, and that it it mm-hmm. really anchors me into my body. I really feel you know like every part of my body, and I feel grounded in it. So I, I actually find it a, an interesting exercise sometimes. And mm. a way to to really show up in in sexual space because you can't not feel what's going on, what's going on when someone's mm-hmm. up your butt in a nice way. Mm-hmm. And what's your experience like as a top? Then do you do you sense that the person who is bottoming is also having that full body experience? I mostly play with men's butts. So mm-hmm. I think uh, the male experience is different than a female experience. Actually, and we talked about we talk about this a little bit, Doctor Carlton. I don't think it feels as sort of full body experience, at least for the, the, the men that I played with. I think for them, it's much more of a topical feel. Please like write and tell us how you're feeling. So if you're listening, if you're a listener who's into butt stuff, we would love to hear what it feels like for you. Yeah. I think that it is a more of a concentrated experience rather than like, like, a, like a full experience that, that I speak, speak about. So it's hard, mm. it's hard to know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. I like topping, to be honest. I enjoy topping. Hands and strap ons are really my favorite. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, for, for guys, we enjoy it, obviously. So a lot of the mm-hmm. time, you know, I'm playing with either straight or bi men who are, in- who are interested in that kind of stimulation. And it's fun. I like it. 
I like the sensation of penetrating masculine energy, I shall say. For some reason, I don't feel so cold to women's butts. Don't know why. I couldn't explain mm. to you. Mm. We have lovely butts. One day, one day, maybe you'll come and explore. You can come. You're invited. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not against it. I'm not like, ew, I'm not touching gold butt. Like, that's not, that's not what I'm, I, you know, if I was, if I was uh, playing with a woman, female identified person, anyone, to be honest, like if, if I was playing with somebody and they made a special request, I'm not going to turn you down. Mm -hmm. Like if we're having fun, <laughs> if I like you, we're, you know, this is fun and games all around. And if you're like, Hey, can you pay my butt some attention? I'm not going to turn you down. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't let me no, that's, that's not what I'm saying. Personally, though, I don't yes. feel cold to if I'm having sex with a woman, my mind isn't going to her butt. I'm not like, oh, I wonder what her butt's mm -hmm. about. If I'm mm -hmm. if it's requested, I will totally go there mm -hmm. and, and spend some time. I just don't feel cold yes. to it. I do feel like maybe on some level, maybe some deep subconscious level, it is power dynamics. It is mm -hmm. something there that's just beyond physical. It's something beyond the physical, I think. I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. I honestly mm -hmm. don't have access to it, but that's what I'm guessing. Yeah. Well, I love the suggestion. I love you saying, ask for it. I mean, I think <laughs> I, that is something that part of this conversation and what we continue to talk about is certainly ask for the things you want, but mm. normalizing talking about these things. Yes. At some point, we were, I was reflecting with you, Effie, about the number of butt-related episodes, like our increasing <laughs> number of butt-related episodes. <laughs> and, we, and you're like, because we need to normalize talking about it, we're yes. going to shout butts from the rooftops yes. so that we can have conversations, both from a place of, of focusing on desire and pleasure and mm. also health, which is really what part of what, what centered a lot of this conversation around. Our guide through all things butts today was Dr. Carlton. Hi, I'm Dr. Carlton and I am a gastroenterologist from San Diego, California. I became internet famous for my TikTok and Instagram uh, discussions about butt stuff and queer health. We found him, as most have, via his incredible and informative TikTok channel, and we learned a lot, both from his videos and from our discussion with him. We started by getting back to the basics. So one of the things that I think is really important for us all to know about our anatomy is the area around the anus is very rich in nerve fibers. These nerve fibers provide a major amount of sensation, and it, you don't even have to have penetration to enjoy anal play with this nerve sensation that's supplied. The light touch, blowing with your, with your breath, touch with a feather, with your fingers, rimming with your tongue, amazing sensation. So those nerve fibers provide a lot of eroticism. So I don't want people to miss out on that. It's not just about sticking it in there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Speaking of sticking it in there, your anus is made of two types of uh, skeletal muscle. So there's an external sphincter made out of the skeletal muscle and an internal sphincter made out of smooth muscle. External uh, skeletal muscle you can control with your mind. It's like a pinch and clench kind of thing. That's when you think about anal uh, kegels, you can clench down, release, clench down, release. That's you controlling your external sphincter. So if you have to go to the bathroom really bad and you're running, you're running, you're running, you're running, you're, running, you're, you're clenching your anal sphincter so that you don't have an accident right there. The internal sphincter, you can't really do that. It's made out of smooth muscles, so you can't control that with your mind, but you can control it with lateral pressure. So one of the things that I'd like to teach that really opens up that anal sphincter uh, on the internal side of things is a relaxation technique called the butt clock. Now, it sounds silly. Sounds great. Sounds like so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> the anus is a circle. Gently lubricate and slide your finger in absolutely straight and press over laterally at three o'clock. So that three o'clock position, you hold it laterally, just lateral pressure. Don't ram it over, but just gen gently hold it so that you feel firm pressure against the, the lateral uh, edge of the sphincter it starts relaxing that tiny little hole open to a larger opening. Mm. You move over to the nine o'clock position, do the same thing for about 30 seconds, mm -hmm. up at 12, down at six. That, that sphincter really starts relaxing and loosening to allow penetration of a penis, a dildo, or whatever you want to put in there. I've gotten amazing feedback on that one 
technique that I basically learned in medical training to do prostate exams because mm-hmm. you have to go a little bit deeper in there to get prostate uh, examinations done. But I've, I've learned to take advantage of that for anal sex. So people around the world have said, oh my God, you've changed my life with this. Just one little bit of knowledge about just laterally pressing up against your anus on the inside to open it up. It's like the key to opening your asshole. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Particularly because I do think that it, it, it requires, that technique requires someone to be slow and patient, exactly. right. which I think is not necessarily what, what to your point where we just like stick things in there. I think that right. there's, first of all, we're like likely tense potentially right. if, if we're new to anal play and like mm-hmm. holding on tight. And then there's just a like lubrication and insertion. And this, I love that you're like, slow down. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And, and I think that's the most important part of anal sex is being intentional, being slow, being patient, using lubrication, allowing things to relax. Because if you don't allow it to relax, then you can rip the lining of the anal sphincter and cause a tear called an anal fissure, which can put someone out of commission for months. Some people even go as extreme as needing surgery for uh, an injury like that. So I think that you have to be very, very careful um, in those first couple of minutes. Also for a bottom, you know, it's, I'll, I'll be the first to admit it. it those first couple of minutes of, of anal play can be a little bit harrowing. So mm-hmm. as soon as you get over those first couple of minutes, it's amazing. But just being able to relax, make this technique part of your foreplay mm-hmm. so that it doesn't become mechanical. Mm-hmm. And it, it really allows things to open up and you can enjoy sex. And, and one of the funny things is I had a bottom on Instagram send me a direct message the other day that said, hey, just so you know, your information is getting out there. I got totally butt clocked by this guy and I didn't even ask him. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's so good. That's a now too. Not to be exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So good. So, good. so uh, yeah, so this this is really yeah. a, a way to relax and open up. Mm-hmm. I can also see how it's also can be erotic. Like I can, you can imagine, even though the way that you're describing it can seem mechanical, but I can totally see how it can be slow and sensual and erotic as you're doing it. So absolutely a part of your fore- foreplay. Absolutely. Yes. And, and for, for men who have a prostate gland, the, the, you know, our G spot, that's where the, pro, you know, the prostate's the G spot. So, and it's just a couple of inches in there, you know, two, four mm-hmm. to five centimeters in to find that spot. Um, if your partner is bent over in front of you and facing away from you, if you enter your, with your finger in about two inches or four to five centimeters and press down at six o'clock, that's where the prostate gland is. Mm. If they're on their back and facing you, mm-hmm. it's up. Mm-hmm. at 12 o'clock, like a come hither motion. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if, you know, if you're going to play in there, make sure that your nails are trimmed, mm-hmm. visual cues and audio cues from your, from your partner to see if your stimulation is strong enough or too strong. Mm-hmm. You don't need to go crazy in there, but just, you know, especially if you massage that area with your fingertip, especially while you're giving a blow job, mm-hmm. simultaneous stimulation of the, of the mm-hmm. penis and the prostate the first time that ever happened to me, I thought I was on a rocket ship ride to the moon. <laughs> it was the most incredible sensation ever. Yeah. And, and it made me realize, wow, people are really missing out. It's yeah. like somebody hit my reset button. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. And I, I appreciate you sharing that as a bottom in the, the first few minutes can be tough because I think that yeah. all of, and if we ever have access to seeing anything, maybe it's, it's via porn, that's not mm-hmm. the image, right? It looks like mm-hmm. insertion no. and then rocket ship immediate, like this yeah. is the best thing that's ever happened to me. So that if you are playing in that way for the first time and it feels uncomfortable, you may be thinking something is wrong with you. Something is wrong with the positioning. So I appreciate you naming that. Right. Absolutely. So you, you really have to, you have to use those first couple of minutes to relax. I always tell people, you know, first of all, if you're going to play back there, make sure that the chamber is empty. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't necessarily have to spend hours douching out your rectum, but you know, use the bathroom. I, I tell people to use fiber supplements to clean up the residue. So it's easier to be clean back there. Rinse with a little lukewarm water until things are clear. Uh, use that butt clock technique to open up. Um, either during foreplay or while you're in your clean out process, if it's right before your play, lubrication, 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 mm-hmm. and and reapply. 
Mm-hmm. You can't use it too much lube when it comes to anal. And I actually like silicone based lube because it's slipperier and it feels like it protects a little bit better. Mm-hmm. It is a little more messy um, if you get it on your sheets and things mm-hmm. like that. But there it that but it really does a great job of of keeping things protected and it's that slippery sensation just makes things go better. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to keep reapplying because water based lube for anal tends to kind of gum up after a while. Mm-hmm. So I tell people also, if you're new to bottoming or even if you're not a new bottom, start on top. So you control how fast things go in Mm -hmm. and someone's just not ramming it in there, Mm -hmm. you know? So start on top. So you, especially if you're taking a wide cock, something really girthy, Mm -hmm. you need to be able to control how things go in there so that you don't rip or tear your anal lining. So Mm -hmm. breathe as you go down, relax, uh, you know, yoga breaths. And also another tip, push out as it goes in, mm-hmm. in that initial sensation. And it also helps open up that, that sphincter a little bit more as well. Interesting. I wouldn't have thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. So those, those are the tips for, for, for bottoms that help. Mm-hmm. Sure. How do you feel about um, gloves? I'm a big fan of gloves when doing anal play as somebody who's penetrating. Mm-hmm. So that I find things like, like um, sharp nails makes things more smooth both going in and staying in that and also i think it helps with just feeling a little bit more hygienic and so if you play a little bit more relaxed uh what do you how do you feel about that also a little little on the kinky side just for funsies yeah absolutely yeah the appearance of them can be really Mm -hmm. sexy also i agree you want to if there's any sharpness to your nails at all if you have any any nail bed underneath at all it's going to be a lot easier for cleanup to just wear a glove for sure Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um it's going to be more protective it really depends on what, what floats your boat. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sure. Mm-hmm. Nice. We have a sense now of what's going on inside of our bodies. So that's one of the barriers uh, mm-hmm. often to, to health and good play is just knowing what's there. The other is being able to talk about it, feeling comfortable mm-hmm. talking even with our physicians about mm-hmm. and asking questions. And so certainly that's what you're seeing in your practice. And I'm wondering if there are some tips around sexual health 101. What do folks need to know and what questions should they be asking? Well, I think that's really important. I, with with queer health in particular, a lot of doctors aren't aware of the things that we need. For instance, I had uh, a friend of mine who moved from California to Arizona and said he went to see his doctor and was on Truvada for PrEP. PrEP is a pill that you take daily to prevent HIV. Um, so mm-hmm. even if you're not wearing condoms, you take PrEP every day, you're not going to get HIV because this medication wards off HIV infection. So he went to get his prescription renewed at his new place in Arizona. He said he walked in the door and there was a 75-year-old, gray-haired, old white man doctor uh, who said, oh, I see you're on HIV medication. Uh, How long have you had HIV? And he goes, oh, I'm I'm not HIV positive. And he Mm -hmm. said, well, why are you taking this medication? He goes, no, I take that to prevent HIV. And the guy looked at him and said, I don't think I can take care of you. So while that's horrifying, I appreciate the honesty of this doctor Mm -hmm. saying, I don't know about your health care, so you probably should find somebody who does. Mm -hmm. And that's really, I think it's our responsibility. You need to either, you know, if you're, if you're, if you have a question about physicians and you're in an area where there are a lot of other gay or queer people, ask them who they go to. Mm -hmm. Who do you like? You know, who do you feel comfortable with? The Gay and Lesbian Medical Association, or GLMA.org in the United States, has a a directory listing of doctors that you can find by your zip code Mm. that may be more comfortable with that situation. But you need to, so the things that queer men need to know are we have certain ways that we need to be checked for STIs. Mm. The traditional STI check is an HIV blood test, a syphilis blood test, a urine test, or urethral swab for gonorrhea and chlamydia. And that's not sufficient for us. If mm-hmm. we suck a dick, we need our our throat swapped. Mm-hmm. You need to get checked where you play because if your if your throat is infected with gonorrhea or chlamydia, and same honestly, same with women. If you suck mm-hmm. a dick and your your throat is infected, it's not going to show up on a urine test. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. If you get fucked in your ass without a condom and there's gonorrhea or chlamydia in there, it's not going to show up on a urine test unless you're also infected in your uh, urethra. So mm-hmm. you need to make sure you get checked where you play. So that's one of my big things. It's really for queer people, but that's for everyone. Sure. Honestly, if, if especially in, in a group of people as, as amazing as a curious box um, mm-hmm. group who are more open-minded and, and play all over, um, make sure you get checked where you play. 
Hepatitis A and B are more commonly spread uh, through gay sex. Hepatitis A is uh, frequently spread through rimming. Hepatitis B is just like HIV. Mm -hmm. So I recommend all people to be vaccinated against hepatitis A and B. The meningitis vaccine for Neisseria meningitidis is important for all gay men every five years, in my opinion, as well, because there are outbreaks of meningitis. There was just one in Florida, mm -hmm. meningitis. And the reason it happens in gay men, it's not a sexually transmitted disease. It's just something by intimacy. Uh, you're close to the person. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is mouth to mouth. And we put our mouths everywhere, <laughs> you know, so uh, and we tend to be clustered in saunas and steam rooms and gyms and things like that and bars, mm -hmm. sharing drinks, kissing, whatever. So so when there's an outbreak, it tends to be more prominent in, in gay men or queer men. So the other thing is the HPV vaccine. Mm -hmm. It was thought of for little girls 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And then they, they added, hey, well, you know, boys have sex too. Boys should be, and boys spread it to girls. So, mm -hmm. you know, it through, if, if you're heterosexual, so we should vaccinate boys too. Well, one of the things that is important for people to know is that HPV causes cervical cancer, yes, mm -hmm. but it also causes anal cancer and throat cancer. Mm. So you need to be very careful with HPV, especially if you're HIV positive. HPV plus HIV brings a 70 times increased risk of anal cancer. So if you're playing back there, you can do an anal, anal pap smear to look mm. and see if there's any precancerous cells back there, just like for uh, cervical pap smears. Mm. So you need to have a doctor who's willing to do that or knows how to do that as well. And then considering that HPV vaccine, it's now available for people up to 45. It mm. used to be just teenagers. But you know the theory on that is that if you are you're probably exposed to HPV by, by that point um, mm -hmm. as you get older. But I think an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure when it comes to anal cancer and throat cancer mm -hmm. and cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so those vaccines are important and you should be up to date on those with your doctor. I just want to clar clarify something because sometimes this mm -hmm. information gets muddy. At least what I, what I understood from what you said is that anal sex doesn't cause anal cancer. It's the STIs no. that you may catch Um, that might cause anal cancer, right? I just want to be super clear about that so right. don't misunderstand. Yeah, it doesn't cause colon cancer. It doesn't cause rectal cancer. Mm -hmm. it, uh, the, the only associated ca uh, increased cancer risk is from anal cancer from HPV infection. Mm -hmm. And because the HPV virus is a, is a, a cancer-inducing virus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. And those cases are pretty, pretty rare. There's only about 9,000 in the United States in a year. But if you can prevent 9,000 cancer deaths, you yeah. know. For sure. I have a question for you because so if you are in an area to your point where you, where there's some community and you can ask ask for referrals, what if either you're in an area within the country where there aren't folks that you could necessarily be asking, or and you shared this with us in, in a conversation mm -hmm. before the podcast that folks from other countries where maybe mm -hmm. uh, sodomy or gay sex is illegal or something. So wondering if there are any thoughts or tips or what your experience of that has been. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because in, in the rural United States, in Al you know, if you're in Alabama versus if you're in San Francisco, your likelihood of access to these, mm -hmm. this kind of care is completely radically different. Mm -hmm. There are companies who provide pre-exposure prophylaxis here, like Hey Mister, who are able to ship out medications, ship out STI testing, uh, do telehealth online with, mm -hmm. uh, with, with people mm -hmm. to be able to make sure that they get the, the preventive care that they need. While that's available in the U.S. and Puerto Rico and other countries, it's not available. And I get people from all over the world. I, you know, I remember this one person from Iran messaged me saying, hey, I'm in Iran. I have something on my anus. If I go to the doctor, I'm afraid I'll get executed because if you are convicted of, mm -hmm. uh, of having gay sex over mm -hmm. here, of sodomy over here, You can, you can actually be executed and I'm terrified. There's something going on. I don't know what to do. And so I said, well, I'm here. I'm on Instagram DM. You can send me a vanishing picture of, of what's going on back there. And I can kind of let you know what I think. And they did. It turned out to be a hemorrhoid. Mm -hmm. um, and to be able to take off that sort of yeah. pressure off of someone, you know, oh my God, I might lose my life. So... <sighs> That, that's been really humbling in this whole experience that people don't have access to care. People are afraid. Uh, so to be able to take that sort of absolute devastating fear off someone's back has, has been amazing. But it also points out the inequities around the world. You know, mm -hmm. 
Pe- people don't have access to this sort of thing. So I try to provide as much information as I can on my Instagram for harm reduction, for proper care. And I try to give tips around situations. Mm. If people can travel to get treated for things like that, then I recommend for them to do that. Mm -hmm. They can't. It's a little tricky that, you know, that you can't exactly help everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So what are some of the ways that we can make sure that our health care provider, our our doctor can take care of us based on our needs? Yeah, I think the first most important thing when you meet your doctor for the first time is to have that conversation is this is how I play sexually. This is mm-hmm. what I do. Are you comfortable taking care of me? Do you need help? If you're, you know, do you need help with what you need to know about my health care? So you, you make sure that you mentioned getting checked where you play, getting your vaccines updated, uh, getting, you know, if you're on PrEP or you're interested in getting PrEP, are you comfortable pr- uh, prescribing PrEP? Mm-hmm. If you're HIV positive, are you comfortable providing HIV care? So those are the things that you need to have a frank conversation with your doctor. Mm-hmm. Uh, believe it or not, most doctors, even though a lot of doctors are very conservative when it comes to taking care of people, our first oath is do no harm and, t- and really to take care of all people, no matter what they, what creed or race or sexual identity or, or nationality or whatever. So I think when it comes to, when it comes to it, just have that conversation and most people will, will do what they can, or at least point you to someone that they know that could. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. In my experience, also the intake process has been an indicator. I had a doctor who in the intake process would ask questions about where I play, how long, with how many partners. And that was just routine as if they were asking me, you know, any other question that that was about my my health. And then certainly have been a part of uh, practices and had doctors that that wasn't the case. Right. And I'm interested in that as well of around some of the more common, particularly men's health issues that are difficult to discuss, to, to break mm-hmm. the ice and say, let me ask you this question or, or I, I want more information about this. Absolutely. Well, you know, I think that uh, erectile dysfunction is one of the one of the most common things that all men face. And it's a difficult subject for some people to bring up. But these days, given the amount of things that are available to treat erectile dysfunction, mm-hmm. it should be something that's very available and easy to talk about from your medications like Viagra and Cialis, which uh, help increase blood flow to the penis to mm. uh, allow erections. That's one way for, for people that that doesn't work for. And there are some people that are Viagra and Cialis just doesn't work for. There are even injectable medications that you can get through uh, urologists that are like rocket fuel to mm-hmm. make things really work mm-hmm. well. <laughs> so, so yeah, there's a lot of options. So I think it's important to not be afraid to talk about the things that really bother you with your doctor. And, and there's that there's even premature ejaculation. Premature ejaculation is where you come before you want to. Some, some people can just be barely touched on their penis and it's over. Mm-hmm. Uh, so talking about techniques and medications that can decrease that premature ejaculation is important. Also, a lot of people can ejaculate and it's important to be able to discuss that with your doctor when it comes to side effects of medications. There are a lot of people on things like antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications. Mm -hmm. Those medications are notorious for causing people Mm -hmm. not to be able to come. Mm -hmm. So if that's causing you not to come, maybe try to figure out a different medication that may decrease your Mm -hmm. lack of orgasm. Mm -hmm. I mean, with erectile dysfunction, premature ejaculation, and not being able to come, from my understanding, there are psychological reasons as well as medical reasons. Absolutely. Right? Would you speak to your doctor about both, or would you expect your doctor to kind of also mention and investigate into the, the psychological parts as well as the medical parts? You're absolutely right when it comes to those things, that the psychology of a lot of it is, is often the root of most people's issues. Doctors are often programmed to think only medically, Mm -hmm. but it's important to keep that, that psychological part in mind. And if your doctor is really not going to talk to you about that, then talking to a therapist about that is really important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about tips for partners? And so either if you are a woman who is with uh, someone who identifies as a woman, someone who identifies or has a male body and and want to encourage some uh, more focus on their health or anyone in your life, frankly, are there some tips that you can provide to folks around supporting the care and health of their partners? 
Yeah, I think the most important thing is for people not to take erectile dysfunction personally. Mm-hmm. It's not about it's not about the wife or the husband that's uh, the partner. Mm-hmm. It's about the way the person's body is physiologically aging mm-hmm. or handling a certain situation. So I, I think a lot of people tend to be like, oh, well, they can't get hard without Viagra, so they're not attracted to me anymore. No, that's not the case at all. Mm-hmm. And a lot of men start having issues with erectile dysfunction as, as early as their late 20s, yeah. uh, 30s, 40s. And it just gets worse as time goes on as mm-hmm. far as that that happening. So it's nothing to take personally. So I think being calm and supportive and not taking it personally is the mm-hmm. first thing because you need to be supportive and not defensive. Mm-hmm. Is there anything that you can do to prevent these? Is there, is there any sort of, um, you know, anywhere from self-care all the way to medication, are there things that you can do to prevent either erectile dysfunction, premature ejaculation and, and, and that group of uh, dys- dysfunctions? Absolutely. The, the preventive things that you can do for erectile dysfunction are not to smoke cigarettes. Smoking is the number one thing that causes erectile dysfunction. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exercise to get good blood flow healthy diet, making sure you're monitoring and managing your cholesterol intake. Mm. Uh, Those things all have a big effect. Alcohol intake also tends to cause a lot of problems with erectile function. So Mm. minimizing those things, maximizing the exercise part of things, uh, very important for maintaining erectile function. And Mm. as far as premature ejaculation, that's often something that happens as as we're younger in our teen years and Mm. and, and early 20s. Uh, but it can happen throughout life and you learn to ejaculate before an event. So if you have a hot date at 10 o'clock, you might want to jerk off at eight mm-hmm. or nine so that you're not so sensitive. Mm-hmm. The stop and hold technique is another way you can just kind of hold on to the tip of your penis as you're about to come and kind of not come and pull back a little bit mm-hmm. and then work back up. So those are some things that can really benefit you in the long run. Mm-hmm. As far as Self-care as well, making sure that when you go on medications that might affect your erectile function, talk Mm -hmm. about that with your doctor. If you're having issues with your blood pressure, blood pressure medications are notorious for causing not only lower blood pressure, but also erectile dysfunction. So Mm. psych meds, blood pressure medications, make sure that you choose medications that are known to have less effects on those areas. With premature ejaculation, doing things like edging or maybe using condoms, Mm -hmm. Uh, to become a little little less sensitive, Definitely. do, do these th- th- does that stuff work as well? That stuff is also an important part of the armament and making sure that you don't ejaculate too quickly. Uh, mm-hmm. Condoms are great, but I've put a condom on a guy before and just putting the condom on the head of his dick, he can't. He can't. Mm-hmm. You know mm-hmm. that that's how bad premature ejaculation can be. Mm-hmm. But there are some numbing solutions that you can put on. I I don't really like those. Mm-hmm. But if you need to use them, you need to use them. Just don't suck someone's dick after they've had a numbing solution on the tip of it or your tongue's going to be numb. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> that's so funny. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, that's actually kind of funny. Um, I do have a question about numbing gels or lubricants, actually. I know that some people use them for anal, and I want your thoughts on that. Right. Absolutely hate that because mm-hmm. you don't know if you're getting injured when you're, when you're numb. Mm-hmm. Yes, the numbing solution helps decrease discomfort and pain, but it also can prevent you from knowing that you're having uh, a tear happening. Mm-hmm. So it's it's like when I talk to a lot of people in the gay community about more extreme things like fisting or other things. Don't be chemically altered because mm-hmm. you don't know what's happening. Sure. That's the, the number one way people get injured is when they can't feel what's happening. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. makes a lot of sense. sense. Absolutely, yeah. You want that connection with your body, and and make sure that it feels good, and you're getting that feedback loop as well. So, um, yeah, okay, that makes sense. I just wanted to put it out there because this this stuff you know goes around. Absolutely, and a lot of people that's that's what they think they're supposed to do. No, don't do that. <laughs> it's supposed to feel great. <laughs> if it hurts, there's something there's something going wrong. You know. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, are any other tips for tops or bottoms? I love the clock. Absolutely going to yeah. be using the clock moving forward. Yeah. I'm wondering if there are any other tips. Yeah. So we talked about uh, bottoming with, you know, making sure you're clean, lubrications, you know, starting on top and breathing and pushing out as it goes in. For tops, making sure that you're patient, tease the hole a little with your tongue, with your finger 
or with a feather even, uh, using that butt clock technique, generous lube application, eye contact and cue reading is the most important thing. If you look like your partner, look at your partner's eyes and they don't look like they're having a good, t- good time, you need to change something. So mm-hmm. change, change positions are, you know, one of the other big things that we were talking about in anatomy is the rectum itself is generally a straight shot, but there are some people are built differently where there are certain things in the way the bladder sticks out a little bit this way or hitting a certain curve is painful. Mm-hmm. So just change mm-hmm. up your position because your curves and another person's curves may fit better if you just change positions. You know, another tip, tip for tops, you know, other than starting slow, the bottom doesn't have to come every time. And a lot of bottoms don't want to come necessarily, but if your bottom wants to come, make sure they finish. Mm-hmm. The other big thing, urinate after you, after sex. It's so mm-hmm. important to flush out the, the urethra so that you don't get bacteria in there, especially if you're having anal, especially if you're in a relationship where you're not using condoms, mm-hmm. married or on prep, and you just don't want to use them. There's a lot of bacteria in the rectum. You need to be able to flush mm-hmm. that out through uh, a simple urination after sex. Yeah, I love those. I mean, those are such those are such good tips. Also, I think some of the things that um I hear a lot is about um, starting small. So before you go in there with a the penis, maybe go with one finger, two finger, take your time, right. even butt plugs, just to kind of warm that area up a little bit, and then before you go to a penis. Absolutely, I think that's great too. You not only the butt clock, but a toy that gradually increases in size. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I have a dildo that has a kind of a small head. And then this, the top part of the shaft is kind of small too. But as you go down that bait, down the shaft, it gets wider and wider and wider and wider. As you insert in, it gently over time kind of it helps expand things so that when you're ready to actually take a dick, especially a thick dick, mm-hmm. it's a lot easier. Sure, sure, sure. Amazing. Such good, rich information delivered with just in, 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 in normalized in such a way that I think is so valuable for not only queer men, but everybody has a butthole. And why not just be curious and wander around and see how it feels, right? Absolutely. And we're t- while we're talking a lot about queer men's health and butt stuff, mm-hmm. what sensations do you guys get? Because I don't have female parts, but a lot mm-hmm. of people say the urethral sponge is kind of in the same area as the prostate. Do you get any sensation when you have anal sex? Are you willing to talk about that? <laughs> I'll do it first. Go ahead. I, I was going to say, I think I'm, I'm probably the willing party here. <laughs> um, okay. I think that, at least this is what I think. I think it's exactly, I think it's hitting something that's actually on the inside the vagina, but from the, right. from the anus. From the and outside. I think it's the, mm-hmm. From the, exactly. And I think it's the, fu- the sensation of the fullness that just enhances the whole of the feeling. At least that's mm-hmm. my experience. I don't think, again, I, I don't I have a prostate, so I don't know. But I'm getting the, I'm, the, mm-hmm. the feedback that I get is that I think the, the prostate piece is a, a much more of a concentrated um, experience, a feeling. This is what I, right. I understand from the, the partners I play with. At least for me, it's not so concentrated. You're not really hitting a, a, um, you know, a, a spot as such. But it is kind of the mm-hmm. fullness and the, the way that it's touching the vagina side in a way that it's not, when you go in, in from um, from the vagina, I think is the, is the sensation for for me. So I don't get this like one spot that is mm-hmm. super sensitive. Right. One of the other things I kind of wanted to, to to talk about as well is rimming. Mm-hmm. Like you said, everybody's got a butthole, and mm-hmm. some people don't want to be penetrated. But rimming is provides amazing intense sensations as well. And I think that. It's a starter for a lot of people. A lot of people think, mm-hmm. oh, there's no way I'm going to put my tongue in someone's ass or around there's someone's ass. But when it comes to rimming, I recommend for people to make sure that they take a shower first mm-hmm. just to make sure everything's clean. Mm-hmm. That makes it a lot better experience. Obviously, it takes away a lot of the nerves from the, mm-hmm. fr- fr- from the situation. I actually worked w- with a company last month that has a new product. It's a butt scrub that leaves a taste. Mm. So they have flavors like like glazed donut hole and and peach <laughs> ring and things like that. That's funny. Uh-huh. So there's all kinds of there's all kinds of different companies that have those sorts of products out that if you're not a, f- a fan of the original recipe, you can you can flavor <laughs> it up a little bit. Or use yeah, flavored lube a- back there a little bit. Yeah. Sure. sure. <laughs> also if you're not ready, I think barriers are okay, right? Dental dams or even saran wrap. Yeah, apps, saran wrap, dental barriers. There's tons of absolute pleasure that still come from just using a dental dam or a, a saran wrap. 
right? You can still get to that area. You can still get the, the sort of the light touch of a tongue without, if you're, you know, Absolutely. if you're not ready, if you don't want to, uh, you know, a, a thin barrier in that. And you can, I think that sometimes makes people yeah. feel better about what they're doing. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So we talked a lot about, I mean, there was such amazing, good information. I'm curious just about what is unique about or important to know about sexual health within the queer community? What are some of the difficulties or what are some of the, the differences, if you will, where you're sort of dealing with queer, queer sexual health mm -hmm. versus your regular heteronormative lifestyle? One of the things that I've noticed in our community as a physician and as a member of the community is that we tend to be a lot more sexually active than, mm -hmm. than the heterosexual community. So mm -hmm. getting STI checks done is, is crucial. A lot of people in, the, in our community now don't use protection. You mentioned all, a lot of stuff about gloves and condoms and saran wrap and dental dams. That's not happening with us mm -hmm. for the most part. Sure. So PrEP is a way that you can prevent HIV if you're not going to use. I mean, obviously, I support the use of condoms. It prevents STIs. It prevents uh, HIV. Really, really big to use condoms. But if you're not going to use condoms, and that's one of the things that I tell, tell my audience, hey, I can preach all day till I'm blue in the face about using condoms. But if you don't use condoms, here are the things you need to do. Get your vaccines, like we mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Get on PrEP to prevent HIV if you're non-monogamous. Mm -hmm. A daily pill or even there are other ways you can take it. but to, to have that guarantee of not getting HIV, it's huge. You know, I grew up in the 80s when everybody was dying of AIDS and, and it scarred me as a gay man. I was terrified to have sex until like the 2000s because all these people were dying around me from, from HIV and AIDS. Now, if someone's HIV positive and they're on medications to the point where they're undetectable, they can't spread the virus through sex. So un undetectable equals untransmittable, U equals U. Mm -hmm. That's a big thing in our community now as well, is the stigma around HIV is mm -hmm. slowly eroding. Mm -hmm. I wish it would eroded a, a lot more quickly. Preventing HIV with PrEP, if, like I said earlier, if you get in trouble where you, oh, and I went out to a bar, I found a hot guy, I had anal sex with him, he came in my ass, I have no idea what his name is or where, where he lives or if he's HIV positive or negative. You can get on post-exposure prophylaxis to prevent HIV from taking hold if you take it within 72 hours. It's better to do it the closer to the event that you can as possible. Mm -hmm. And you know, your doctor or an emergency room or a local HIV clinic, or there are a lot of options for getting post-exposure prophylaxis. That's what it's called, mm -hmm. PEP, post-exposure mm -hmm. prophylaxis. Sure. So those, those things are important to know. You know, HIV care is, you know, HIV is still common in our community. I, I read a thing today where one in five new HIV infections is happening in people 13 to 25 years old in the United States. Mm -hmm. So getting such a sex education out to our community, to mm -hmm. everyone, even younger people is really important to know how to prevent HIV. Yeah. So those, those things are important. Our community also tends to drink a lot more and smoke a lot more. So making sure that we monitor our pulmonary health, our liver health, also important psychologically, a lot of gay people are depressed or anxious, mm. or it's important to address our, our psychological health as well or to reduce our risk of uh, things like suicide because of our lack of acceptance in certain, certain communities or from our own families. So I think that all of these things kind of wrap together to, to make a lot of uh, queer health more well-rounded if you mm -hmm. can find someone who can help you address all those things. Super helpful. And I think, I feel like we've done, mm -hmm. we've done a, a little bit falls in our part to sort of at least start a conversation to get people focused on what they need to take care of. I know that um, a lot of our listeners queer on the scale somewhere, you know, a lot of, um, we have a lot of gay and queer people in our community and uh, even with partners who are like bi folks or partnered with straight folks so I think this is this is super helpful for everyone to know. Um, also, parents with the gay kids, we know that mm -hmm. you know those mm -hmm. people are in our communities as well. So uh, in our in our curious folks community as well. So I think this information is super relevant and and important to talk about. So appreciate that and really appreciate mm -hmm. the work that you do. I think, um, like you said, you're really touching people all around the world that need this information. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate all that. And then you know, on top of that. The things that we mentioned we, earlier, we had talked about anal, anal cancer prevention, you know, mm -hmm. with vaccines or with anal swabs. 
prostate cancer checks for all men, PS, you know, for digital rectal examination of the prostate, the blood test for uh, prostate uh, cancer called the PSA for younger men from 15 to 35, especially those monthly testicular examinations to prevent testicular cancer or to, to find it early. And then colon cancer screening for everyone now is age 45 and up, men and women, uh, 45 years old, you get your colonoscopy, you can prevent colon cancer from happening uh, by detecting polyps, which are the things that grow and change into cancer. So mm. all that kind of falls in that, that preventive realm when it comes to sexual health. And obviously cervical cancer screening, screening for people with a cervix. Thank you. I think that we've been speaking so much recently, I think as a global community and certainly as a nation around care and rest and mental health and, you know, want to make sure that this is a part of that process of, of taking care of ourselves is that we take care of our bodies and that we're talking about all the things that we need. So sticking with me, uh, mm -hmm. you know, check where I play, certainly the anal clock. I think that there's so many things that you, I can see why you're TikTok famous and Instagram famous because <laughs> you're able to digest things. You're able to, to put things in, in such easy ways to remember. Before we end our time with you, you have done mm -hmm. a beautiful job of helping us have conversations about things that are intimate. And so we want to ask you four questions to get a little sure. bit more intimate with you. The first of which is, what is one piece of advice that you would give to your younger self about love, sex, or relationships? I think the number one thing is to that I would change about my earlier life is to not be so jealous of when it comes to partnerships and sex, sex is sex and love is love. And I wasn't able to separate sex and love as a younger person. And it really adversely affected my sex life that way. I could have had so much more sex, so much more experience, so much more fun if I hadn't been so jealous as a, as a younger person. Mm, okay. That's excellent. It's the first time we're hearing that one, actually. That's a good advice. Yeah. Okay, what is one romantic or sexual adventure on your bucket list? Well, sexual adventures have pretty much been taken care of. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say romantic adventure. I'm going to Greece this summer and that's on my bucket list. And I think that's going to be so romantic. I can't wait. Yeah, so nice. Where in Greece are that's you going? Beautiful. Santorini, Mykonos, and Athens. Mm. Nice, nice. I'll be across the water from you, so wave at me. <laughs> I'll wave. <laughs> um, how do you challenge the status quo? It feels self-evident, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. <laughs> how do you challenge the status quo? I challenge this, the status quo by uh, trying to normalize butt stuff. You know, everybody's got one, like you guys say. Mm -hmm. uh, there's pleasure for everyone, gay, straight, bi, queer, everybody's got a butt and butt stuff doesn't make you, you know, it's not reserved for a gender or a sexual orientation. It doesn't make you masculine or feminine. And I think I challenge that status quo daily. Nice. Beautiful. So we are a curious bunch around here and we are curious about what you're curious about lately. I think my curiosity personally has been around uh, fisting. Fisting mm -hmm. is uh, something that seems to have really gained a lot of popularity during the pandemic. It's something I've never done personally, but I'm very, very curious as to uh, how it feels and to fist as a top or a bottom. I mm -hmm. always thought of it as a dom sub kind of thing, mm -hmm. but people that I've interviewed, because I teach the anatomy of it and how to do it properly, mm -hmm. but the connection that people have with fisting and being fisted is something that I've never expected when I talk to people mm -hmm. who are um, in the fisting community. Yeah. It takes a certain amount of trust, you know? Sure. <laughs> yeah. And I imagine the reason why it got popular during COVID is that it takes time, right? Um, you need to <laughs> take does. your time doing that <laughs> stuff. And people, um, and people have lots of time. <laughs> yes. Yes. So I think that's probably why, why I would imagine that's why it got popular. And boredom, right? I'd like boredom of the regular, right. like boredom of regular sex and plenty of time. You're like, oh, Let's just get into this this thing that is a little bit out on the edge. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, when I've done fisting, that I've I have fisted somebody. I have tiny, I'm a, I have tiny girl hands, right? So oh. you know, it's kind of the right tool for this. Honestly, when I think right. about guys fisting each other, I, I it does make me hold my breath a little bit. Yeah, with like boy hands, I'm like, I don't know, that's a little scary to me. I have friends who are, who do fisting porn, and they're like over elbow deep in i'm like how in the how in the world do you take how do you yeah. do that you know but but that's that's pretty wild 
Yeah. So there's something that I don't necessarily want to jump into, but I'm very curious about it. Mm. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for your thank time. You. Thank you for sharing all the wisdom. This is really fantastic conversation. Thank you for helping me spread the message. Beautiful. Beautiful. A little nice. clunky on my side, but beautiful. You can learn more from Dr. Carlton on his TikTok and Instagram channels at Dr. Carlton, D O C T O R C A R L T O N. And while you're online, you can look us up by going to our Facebook group and joining the conversation at We Are Curious Foxes. You can share this podcast with friends and family and share far and wide. And that will also start a conversation. You can come onto our Patreon where you will have access not only to our podcast episodes ahead of time, but fun extras and videos from all of our previous workshops. Also at We Are Curious Boxes. And finally, we want to hear from you. So please email us, send us a voice memo, share a question or story at listening at wearecuriousfoxes.com or our new number, 646-450-9079. This episode is produced and edited by Nina Pollock, who, whether we're talking about butt stuff or conflict resolution, make sure we sound crystal clear. Our intro music is composed by Dev Saha. We are so grateful for their work and we're grateful to you for listening. As always, stay curious, friends. Curious Fox podcast is not and will never be the final word on any topic. We solely aim to encourage curiosity and provide a space for exploration through connection and story. We encourage you to listen with an open and curious mind and we'll look forward to your feedback. Stay curious, friends. Stay curious. 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 Stay curious.